Okay, hi everyone. This is Kara Parfit. I am the Marketing and Sales Support Manager here at Certant. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us today for this webinar on wireless network planning. We really appreciate the time. Uh, presenting today is our network engineering team manager, Sam Sexton. Sam is actually our resident wireless expert, along with also being the network engineering team manager, and is, uh, is coming up on his five-year anniversary here at Certant. Um, heading up the wireless team, and, and he really runs point on just about every large wireless project that we do here. So um, I'm going to be handing it over to him here in just a second, but also on hand to be answering questions um, on the webinar platform is Kyle Kreischer, one of our senior network security engineers. So if you have questions throughout the webinar, please use the Q&A box on your webinar screen to submit those, and we will do our best to answer those as they come in. And if there's anything that we want to leave for Sam, we will hold those and pass those along to him um, while he hopefully has time to do some Q&A at the end of the webinar. So we will make sure to follow up on anything that we don't get to. So all that being said, I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to Sam to get started. Go ahead, Sam. Hey, Kara, for that uh, introduction. Um, today, we're going to be talking again about wireless network planning and the do's and don'ts. Um, with everything that we're covering, though, I want to make a point uh, that everything that we're going to talk about is really high level, um, a high view, I should say. Um, there's so much more to wireless than just what we're discussing today. We could talk about wireless for days. So really, we're trying to give you a foundation for your next wireless design or how to take steps to fix the current uh, wireless environment you find yourself in today. So for today's webinar, the main topics we're going to be covering is first, why discuss wireless and why it's important. Uh, next will be pitfalls of bad design. Uh, when you have bad design, there's different ways it can show its ugly head and hurt your environment. And we're going to cover some of the, the most common and, uh, and why they affect us in the ways that they do. Uh, and finally, how to achieve good design. Um, again, with all these, achieving good design, the pitfalls of, of bad design, and, and why discuss wireless, we're really going to be giving you that foundation for your next wireless project or, again, to fix your current environment. Now, some topics we will not be covering today uh, will be advanced antenna tips, outdoor installation, or new technology. And you can find more fun installations on wireless at badfi.com. So why discuss wireless? Wireless is no longer a perk. For so long in the past, uh, wireless was always a perk. If you went into a retail environment or a business and they had wireless, you were excited because they actually had it. Nowadays, it's an expectation. But that expectation goes so much further. It's no longer expected to just be there. It's expected to work well. So with wireless, we need to change our mindset. We have to go from being a perk to being just as important as our wired environment. And when we have that mindset and we take these steps, we're going to have an overall better, productive wireless environment. And the reason we have to have that mindset is your average employee now has two to four wireless-enabled devices on them at all times. Now, you may be thinking, that seems a bit high, but let's just take a moment to just examine a standard person. They may have a laptop. Uh, a mobile phone, sometimes two mobile phones if they have a personal and a business line. Nowadays, we have connected watches that use Wi-Fi if they're not on LTE. And then a lot of people carry around tablets and e-readers. So your standard employee can easily exceed two devices and get to that four or even higher realm um, on any given day. And that also goes for your guest network. You never know how many devices an individual visiting your building or your retail space can potentially have. And it's also becoming more important, Cisco Networks every year looks at all the data uh, that they gather each and every year by how the switches are used and the type of traffic, and they always release predictions. And the, currently, their prediction for wireless is by 2021, 63% of all IP traffic will be from mobile and wireless devices. Only 37 will be from hardwired devices. This is up from 2016's total of 49%. This trend is not going anywhere but up when it comes to wireless. Think now if you were to purchase a brand new Ultrabook or premium notebook, you're going to purchase something that is thin and does not have an Ethernet port. 
because we are becoming a wireless society in a wireless world. As I said before, we have to remember and treat our wireless network just as it is important as our wired network. Now, with wireless, in the past, there were different ways that we installed. And we used the tools that we had. And if we were all in the same room today, after talking about these different techniques, I would ask anybody to raise their hand that did one of the following. And possibly embarrassed, all of us would probably raise our hand because this is how it was done. And we had to do the best with the tools that we had. So we want to discuss on what we used to do and why we can't do that any longer when, when forming a wireless network. So for the most part, everything was based on guessing. And guessing doesn't work anymore. We had old AP on a stick, which would involve uh, a wireless professional or an IT professional installing an access point from a good place they thought would be a starting point. They would then get on a laptop or some wirelessly enabled device and walk around their office or building, pinging either their gateway or a DNS server until the pings eventually started to drop off. They would make note at where they were standing and they would install another AP there. And this was the best way to know how far our signal went. Now, forms of AP on a stick are used today to enhance true wireless surveying and predictive models, but the way that we used to do it just doesn't, it doesn't work anymore. The next way that was really common, and we still see this a lot today, is what I like to call shot-in-the-dark placement. It's your best guess. People look at their floor plan, look at the layout of their building, and decide that an AP should maybe go here and another one should go there, and that's good enough. Again, when wireless was just a perk and when you were happy to have it, that was good enough, but in today's environment, that just isn't getting the job done, and we need to take, make sure to take in to more than just our general area, and we're going to talk more about that. And then place where coverage is bad. This wasn't really a tactic. It was more so a Band-Aid. If you did tactic one, AP on a stick, or your guesswork shot in the dark placement, you would find holes in your wireless, a conference room or an auditorium where individuals complained about the wireless. And the solution was to just place another AP there. Um, again, this would work in smaller environments, and it was good enough when things were, um, when much wasn't expected of wireless. But nowadays, and especially if you have a large office, more care and consideration needs to be taken into building that wireless network. And the reasons for it, none of these tactics have consideration for capacity, have consideration for future growth, have no consideration for any signal-to-noise ratios or other environmental noise that you're getting from other devices or other people in your environment, and have no consideration for bandwidth. And none of these equal a true three-dimensional plan or model. Now, problems with bad design. So we did one of the previous tactics. We installed via AP on a stick or via, via shot in the dark placement. We placed a few extra APs where areas were bad, but we're still having problems. What are some of the common problems we would then see if we have bad design? The first is going to be fake coverage versus real coverage. Now, there's a few ways to, to dive into this. The first big piece is when you're troubleshooting a single individual and either their laptop, their tablet, their mobile device, and you look in the bottom right-hand corner of that laptop and you see that you have full bars of wireless signal, yet that user is unable to hit local resources or Internet resources from their device. And that's because you have fake coverage. Access points are powerful devices, and if turned up to full power, can cover a great distance and fill it with wireless signal that doesn't mean that that signal is usable. And this is the, the environment that you create with bad design. So when you think you have coverage and you think everything is, is within the green or good, your users can't actually use it. And it's because the return traffic isn't able to make it as far as the wireless access point. Now this leads to a few different things. First, it kills two-way communication. And it slows down that user, but can also slow down the entire network. If enough people are connected to an access point and you have one or more users who are encountering that fake signal, they're going to become something called a hidden node. Now, a hidden node 
is just that, what we described before, a user that thinks they have good signal, but the return traffic can't make it back. Now, these wireless access points we're using are not like an advanced managed switch. They're more like a hub. So we each take a turn. If one of those individuals taking a turn is taking a long time because of poor signal, poor return signal, causing slow speeds or packet loss, as they take more time, everybody else on that access point is waiting for their turn. It's almost like we're all in a self-checkout line. And if somebody brings more than 10 items, we have to wait for them to finish their transaction. The other best analogy I can use is two people playing catch. But it's not just two people. If we're going to refer to one person as the AP, we're going to call them Randy Johnson. And the other person, which is the mobile user, we'll say is an eight-year-old boy. Now, depending on how far apart they stand, they could have a good time or a bad time playing catch. Let's say they're going to stand as far apart as Randy Johnson can throw. So Randy Johnson, being the legend that he is, is going to stand on home plate, and the kid, the eight-year-old boy is probably going to be somewhere in the outfield. Randy Johnson has a strong arm, and he'll hit him every single time. Now, that little boy, when he throws it back, he's not barely making it to the infield. So that's a dropped packet. Luckily, Randy Johnson has a bucket full of baseballs, and he'll just keep throwing them to the kid, but the kid is never able to get the ball back to Randy Johnson. Now, with proper design and controlling power and controlling distance and controlling roaming, now the little boy gets to stand at second base. And the two of them will play pitch and catch back and forth to each other with no drop balls or drop packets in this analogy. And everything will go smooth and everyone will have fun. If that little boy, if we use that into our, our wireless environment, that little boy standing in the outfield is a hidden node. And while Randy Johnson can hit him, that's fake coverage. When we shrink our zones down and we form good wireless, what we like to call silos or zones, we shrink the fake coverage to only the real coverage that we truly have, and we eliminate hidden nodes. Another problem with fake coverage is a failure to roam. Now, a lot of people think roaming is done on the wireless access point level, that the access point has control over where people connect. And while some advanced wireless devices have some programs and solutions to help with roaming, roaming is truly determined by the user. Now, most of your mobile devices, your iPhones, iPads, Android tablets, you know, Samsung Galaxy phones, things like that, they're all hard-coded on when they're supposed to roam. And it's based on having a signal that reaches certain levels or, or, or has a, um, hits a certain weakness. Once the signal hits a certain level of weakness, those devices will start to look for another access point, a better signal on the network that you're currently connected to. A laptop such as a, a Windows 10 laptop, you actually have the ability to control that level somewhat in advanced features, but even then you could just tell it to be more aggressive or be more sticky. Aggressive meaning roam more often, sticky being stay on the access point that you're currently on. And those all serve a purpose, but for general roaming, for the general user, if we have fake coverage, as a user who maybe has a great experience, let's say, in their office. They're in their office on their laptop and their phone, and their wireless is great. But they get up and they walk to the conference room. Now, in the conference room, you have a dedicated access point. But every time people come from their offices to the conference room, wireless is terrible. And you don't know why, because, again, there is a dedicated access point. It's because they have a failure to roam. If their signal back at the AP by their offices is too strong, they're never going to let go of that access point, and you run into a hidden node and fake coverage. So again, when you have proper wireless zones, proper segmentation between your access points and power levels, your users will then naturally roam from one AP to the next. So roaming is, is decided by the user, but is formed by your design. The last and most common issue that we run into on a regular basis is signal overload. Now, this is an oversaturation because of too many APs, or it can be environmental. Now, oversaturation of signal when it's self-inflicted is by putting in too many APs. Sometimes the solution is the opposite. You know, we have people who, who did make designs and blast everything at full power, and they have a ton of fake signal. Uh, the flip side of that coin is they put in too many APs and leave them at high power, 
and they just bombard themselves, which I like to describe as just a bunch of APs screaming at each other, right? Everything has to listen. They're all radio waves. And if we oversaturate, we're going to create just as bad of an environment by not having enough signal. Now, sometimes this is environmental. And what that means is if you're in an office building or you're a retail chain, let's say in a plaza or, or a mall, you're going to be dealing with not only your signals, but everybody else's wireless signal. And you can't control theirs. So there are some tactics we can take, and we'll discuss deeper to those uh, in future throughout this webinar. But environmental and self-inflicted are, are one of those we have control over. So let's not shoot ourselves in the foot with our wireless design, and then let's try to cope with all the, uh, the environmental pieces that we have to deal with. Now, to kind of put the point home that devices aren't as strong as access points, or some devices don't listen on certain channels, I'd like to take everybody to um, basically Michael Bano's website, clients.michaelbano.com. And we'll send this out to everybody. This is a great database put together by wireless professionals of tons of user devices. As you see on here, you see like an Amazon Echo, an Amazon Fire TV, um, uh, Chromecast devices. These show what channels a device is willing to listen on, if it's multi-user MIMO or Wave 2. Um, if you slide over, which this is just a screenshot, you're also going to see maximum transmit power. Now, maximum transmit power may look high on some of these devices, but that's if they're plugged in and they're, they're going full go. You take a laptop, let's say a MacBook, that has maximum transmit power, half as much of, a, of an access point, but it starts to lose battery and gets down to that 30 40% range, it's not going to be as powerful as it is plugged in sitting at a desk. Well, this is a great resource, and you could potentially look up some of the devices you have in your environment, know that it's in a optimum situation that you get these results. Now, channels and, and what version of 802.11 they are, that's obviously set in stone, but the transmit power can obviously change. So how do we achieve good design? We've talked about all the, some of the, not all, but some of the pitfalls of bad design. How do we get to a place where design isn't a problem, where we actually have good design? First, having a wireless survey or predictive model done in your environment will always set you up for success. Now, obviously, it's dependent on the person who's doing the design, but this is the best thing you can do to put yourself in the proper direction for good design. In this scenario, they're going to measure and map out your environment, form a model of what they expect wireless to do in your environment, and you'll know exactly where to install your access points and exactly how to configure them so that your wireless network is set up for success. Now, with these solutions, though, there are steps you need to take to have something like this done. The motto in our office and our wireless team is garbage in, garbage out. You always have to remember that the design that you're making or that somebody else is making is only as good as the information they put in or only as good as the information that you give them. The best way I can explain this or give an example is if I'm building a predictive model for someone and I'm trying to set my model to scale. Let's say it's a 50,000 square foot building and I need to set scale and I ask them to measure a hallway. And they come back and say, the hallway is 20 feet. Let's say the hallway really was 23 feet. Now in my 50,000 square foot model, every 20 feet, I'm going to be three feet off. While that hallway, it may not make a big difference because wireless signal isn't gonna come down to the final three feet. But as we extrapolate that data to a full 50,000 square foot model, we're going to find that we're going to have some pretty big holes of data. The other way I describe this is we need to know about our environment. Garbage in, garbage out, remember. So you look at a wall and you think it's drywall. Great, drywall. We put it in our model. Yet when we put an access point near that wall, no signal is getting through. That's because beneath that drywall is brick. Now, what happens between drywall and brick is called attenuation, which is basically the absorbent absorption of wireless signal. Drywall versus brick. Brick is about three times more absorbent than drywall. So knowing if that wall is brick or if that wall is drywall or that wall is cinder block is going to make a big difference in your wireless design, especially if we're losing three times as much signal as we go through. 
And finally, when you're making a plan, don't just think about today. Think about the future. Think about tomorrow. You may build a perfect plan for today's environment, but if you plan on having the solution last you three to four years, you have to know about what's coming down the pipeline. Maybe today you have 10 users using laptops, but you have in the budget for next year to move another 100 to laptops. Can your wireless network support that? Today you don't have all your remote users coming to the main office. But you know starting next year, you're going to have a massive training or a massive conference. Can you support those guests, those devices, those users? And if you can't, based on the design that you're building, you have to manipulate it to be ready for tomorrow. One of the key things with this, in, in knowing about tomorrow, knowing what can come down the pipeline, is sometimes you will have a design where access points are going to be underutilized. Perfect example would be our office here at CERTIN. In our conference room, we have a dedicated access point. On a day-to-day -day scenario, it only has maybe four to five people connected to it, and even then it's sparingly on when the conference is being used. But on days that all of our remote employees come to the office, all of our sales team, our remote engineers, our owner, HR, everybody comes in for a quarterly meeting, our conference room is to max capacity. And in that moment, our wireless design is ready to handle those connections and will work just as it does on a day when none of those connections are in our building. So you may look at it and see that some access points just aren't utilized, but that's okay because we know in the future they will be. With wireless design, there's also these core questions that we should always ask when making, when forming a design or when we're concerning wireless. Now, there are more things that go into building a design than just these questions that we're going to cover right here. But if you at least, at bare minimum, ask these core questions, you're going to be setting yourself up for success. So the first one is, who wants wireless and who is it important to? Now, if you yourself, as a potential IT professional, director of IT, want wireless, and it's your personal pet project to get wireless into your building, and it's important to you, obviously, you want to do a good job, but the expectation may be set differently than the CEO or CIO of your company stating that he wants complete production wireless. The importance of knowing this is it's going to help with your budget. If your CEO, if this is something he wants, stressing that predictive model, that wireless survey is going to help you get the tools to do the job better. You never want to throw something together, especially if those who are setting the expectations have high expectations for that job. What do you want to accomplish with your wireless solution? Are we just forming a guest network? Are we forming a production network? Are we trying to have both? How many people will be on each network? And what is the maximum number we need to support? Now, well, that may also seem like a simple question, and I want to stop on capacity for a reason. It may seem simple to discuss capacity, but it is so much more complicated. Remember earlier we talked two to four devices per person. So let's really think about it. If we form a production and guest wireless network and we have, let's say, 50 employees and 50 laptops, okay, that's not just 50 people we have to support. You need to think on a device level. So that's 50 laptops on production, plus we have to assume at least another 50 cell phones or connected watches or iPads on guest. So now we're actually up to 100 even though only 50 people are in the building. Now, on a busy day, maybe we have another 50 guests walk through our building. We cannot assume that those 50 guests only have one device on them. We have to assume that they at least have two to three to build proper infrastructure. So now, instead of just 50 devices, we're closing in on 150 to 200 devices as a maximum number. Again, as I said before, some of your access points will be underutilized from time to time but can you take on the busier moments, the busier days? Can your conference room support that all-team meeting or that training that you want to have in the future? So you really need to take those capacity questions very seriously and really take good inventory of what you think you're going to have. The other piece is bandwidth needs. Now, this is important and is especially important from a production standpoint if you're going to be running some 
bandwidth intensive applications on your production network. Uh, nowadays, perfect example would be soft phones. Right? You can turn a simple, cheap Android phone into a production VoIP phone with a Bluetooth earpiece for everybody in an office. Well, if we're not hardwiring those Android phones in, they're connecting via wireless. Do we have the bandwidth and the speed to support VoIP calling to where it's nice, crisp, and clear? If all of our users are on laptops now, and they're pulling a lot of files from a file server, and it's all happening on the wireless. Do we have the bandwidth needed to support those type of transactions? Where do I want and need signal? This, may, again, may, like capacity may seem very simple, but take stock of every place you have in your building that you truly want wireless signal. If you have a basement or a storage room that you have no intention of ever needing wireless, don't spend the money to place APs in there or have cable runs done if you're never going to use wireless there. There's an opportunity to save some funds in your wireless project. Now, with that answer, though, or with that question, again, remember one of the golden rules, we always think about the future. You may not need wireless in the storage room today, but next year you're buying handheld devices to scan inventory. Well, now you need wireless. So while thinking about the future, truly determine where you need wireless. And then come up with the areas that are high traffic. Now, this ties into capacity, but it's really about, like I said, a conference room or an auditorium or a training room where a maximum number is going to be high. It's always good to make sure you know where you're going to be connecting devices. One of the best analogies for high traffic is uh, multiple years back at Levi Stadium in San Francisco, Extreme Networks did the wireless. And this is one of, to my opinion, one of the most interesting um, wireless scenarios I've ever ever read about. And this is because on that day, over 30,000 people connected to their wireless, and the average number of users to APs was 17 and a half. I'm going to let that sink in. It was 17 and a half per AP. Now, a lot of these access points, especially the ones they were using, can maintain hundreds of connections. Your standard small uh, to medium business side access point can normally do 100 to 150. That doesn't mean we push it to 100 or 150. Because remember, we're like a self-checkout line. If we have 100 people connected to an access point, if you're number one, you're getting your transaction. If you're number 99 or number 100, you have numerous connections in front of you before you get a turn. Now, while this is all happening at milliseconds and at you know high connectivity and speeds of high connectivity, it still is latency, and it still is creating potentially a bad wireless environment for your users. Now, as we talk about bandwidth, I'm going to hit the next two here, because they, they really are together. Can your wired backbone support the wireless solution you want, and can your ISP support your new wired and wireless network needs when they're combined? This could have been on a pitfall, because we run into this quite often. Um, and as a firewall company, we actually run into it for one more solution, which is can my firewall support all the new connections I'm putting onto my network, not just the ISP or our backbone. You may want to do a ton of upgrades. You may think about everything you need to accomplish with wireless and perform a perfect wireless design. But if you're still on a slow, small ISP connection or your backbone can't support those connections or your firewall can't handle the traffic, you're only as fast as your slowest device, and it's going to tear down all the work you did to get that wireless design set up. So making sure to think about your ISP, your backbone, and for better luck, your firewall is always going to be good, good thought spent in forming that wireless design. I want to show the difference in design. So this is actually a project we work on. This is a customer of ours who came to us with wireless problems. Now, they did shot-in-the-dark placement. These are the four places they placed access points. And as you see, you see a lot of gray. The best way to describe gray is that that is fake signal. Now, we build our plans on anywhere between like a negative 67 to a negative 72 signal. And I'm, we don't need to dive much into that, but all of that is considered usable signal. Anything that's in gray is stuff that you will see, signal that you will see that gives you spotty coverage. So this customer came to us and said, our wireless is good in some places, terrible in others, and we're having tons of problems. Please help us. 
let us know what we need to purchase and help us form a competent wireless solution. So first I built them a model on where they, they told me exactly where they placed their APs, how they placed their APs, and I built them a complete comprehensive model of what their environment was. And every room that I told him he would have strong coverage, he agreed with me, coverage was great. But their roaming and their fake coverage was running rampant. On top of all of this problem, of this, this piece that you're seeing that's a problem here, they were on the 24th floor of a 30-story building. They were surrounded with environmental signal. This is the plan that we made for them, a predictive model two and a half years ago. Now, as you look in the predictive model and in the shot in the dark, you're also going to see some pink. Uh, part of the reason why I love this as an example, this was a law office, and they had six-foot-tall filing cabinets that were filled to the max with files. They kept a, a physical copy of everything, and they kept a digital copy of everything. The physical copies were absolutely killing wireless signal. In a nine-foot ceiling, if six feet of that nine feet is filled with a solid, you know, steel, filled with paperwork filing cabinet, it's just going to absorb and destroy wireless signal. This is earlier when I said having a three-dimensional model is important. In our model, we can design those filing cabinets to the proper thickness, the proper depth, the proper height, and we can take all those into effect when we're forming our predictive model. Now, this is the solution they've used for two and a half years. Um, I actually talked to the customer today and double-checked their tickets. They've submitted one wireless ticket in two and a half years after having pretty much one a week. That one ticket was to update the passwords. So having good design is going to fix so many problems. Their guest network is great. Their production network is great. And it's all because of design and taking the time. Now, as I mentioned before, they have an environmental problem that they have. They are, they are in the 24th floor of a 30-story building. So could we have made a design with maybe one or two fewer access points? The answer is yes. And you'd say that I'm contradicting myself because I said too many access points creates a saturation of signal. But what we did for their environment is we took their access points and we toned them down to form smaller, crisper zones of wireless to help compete with all that shouting that's happening in their building. As, as the individual I worked with always put, he's like, you know, I wish I could go to every one of these other offices and on all these floors and tell them to tone on their wireless, but I don't have that authority. And people, it's a free country, can do what they want. So we built a design to combat that noise and to combat their environment, letting them have a crisp, usable signal with defined roaming zones. So one individual can walk from one side of the building to the other side, and they will slowly go from access point to access point. For any of you that's been on a college campus, uh, the best way to describe it is the emergency blue lights, uh, or a hospital for that matter, they have them too. The rule for the emergency blue lights is from any one emergency blue light, you're capable of seeing the next one. And that's how roaming works, too. Now, the reason they have that is for safety. If you go from one light to the next, they know where you're going, and they can meet you there. But from a wireless standpoint, we want a clear path that if one user is in the left side of the building and they need to go to the conference room on the right, we know when access points, we know when handoff is going to occur, and we know where they will end up, and they will be on the proper access point with good signal. Now, let's say we have our design, or we want to do a design. We're going to ask our core questions. We have to make sure we design first and focus on the product second. Allow your design and all of your answers determine what you buy. This is another problem that we've seen from time to time where customers will buy the product first, then come to us and say, I have six access points. Please do a model for me to tell me where to put them. I'm very happy that they want to do a model and I commend them for wanting to do a model, but maybe their building needs 10 access points, or maybe they only need four. Let the design dictate what you buy and how you buy it and how much you buy of it. The reason why you want your, your model to tell you what to buy, not just quantity, is because, especially when you're dealing with more advanced access points like Arahive and Ruckus, they have different types. 
maybe a wall panel access point or an omnidirectional access point or uh, one with external antennas, one with internal antennas. They all have different radiation patterns. And when you build a predictive model, you use those different radiation patterns to know exactly what the access point is going to do. Maybe in your conference room you need a wall panel access point. Well, if you already bought six ceilings or ceiling omnidirectional ones, now you're still have to pay money. So know what you need before you buy it. In the end, it's going to save you time and money. Time from troubleshooting problems, time from being able to deploy faster, and time from not needing to try to fit a jigsaw puzzle together or a round peg in a square hole. And it's going to save you money in case you would have bought too many, right? Uh, again, the best is, you know, people buy access points, they install them a year later, they finally get the plan, and they realize they bought four too many. Well, that's money they can't get back. That's, that's budgeting, right? So let's build the design, form a complete plan, and then know what we need to buy. Now, you can know about what vendor you need to buy, and that's good to do because when you build your model, you need to know what type of radiation patterns you have to do it. But don't pick your access point or don't pick how many you want until your design is complete. As a firewall first security company, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about security. And you have to think about security when you're forming a wireless design. Now there's two buckets that we're gonna talk about. First being guest wireless, right? Each of these have different needs when it comes to security. So with security, I always at least say you must ask pretty much four key things about your wireless. First, should it be open or secure? Now, if you're a retail organization, I recommend open guest Wi-Fi. That doesn't mean you can't have secure, it doesn't mean it's wrong to have secure, but in a retail space where users are popping in and popping out and wanting to maybe look at reviews for a product before they buy it, price check and see that you're the best price so they buy it right there, having easy and accessible wireless is always a good thing. Now, if you're a business, a standard office, I would recommend secure. The reason being, you don't want other, you know, if you're in an office building that you share with other companies, you don't want other companies piggybacking on your wireless and absorbing your bandwidth, right? So you want to keep that secure. While it may not have access to resources, it does have access to your bandwidth. In a retail space, you expect users to come and go. And in most cases, you would restrict that bandwidth. Allowed applications, or what applications do we want to allow? Now, in here, when thinking about this, it's always recommended that you at least restrict or control bandwidth for a few different types of applications. I would strongly recommend blocking anything that's peer-to-peer -peer on, on a guest wireless network. That could be for business or retail. Uh, you don't want people to abuse or use your wireless network for illegal activities. I would also recommend restricting access or restricting the, the amount of bandwidth Devices can use for things such as Netflix, uh, all your mobile uh, streaming audio services such as uh, iTunes Music or Apple Music, Spotify, Pandora Radio, Amazon Music, things like that. It's not that you need to block them, but you need to control how much bandwidth they can use. Netflix being the perfect example. The way Netflix works is that they will continue to absorb bandwidth until they hit the optimum resolution for the device that you're currently using. If you have a 4K laptop, it will try to produce 4K on your laptop. If it's an HD screen, it will go to 1080p. By restricting that bandwidth, you're doing a couple of things. First, you're saving your own bandwidth. You're not allowing one user to absorb all of it. But if you also go in and you restrict everybody to a small piece of bandwidth, you're actually ensuring a better, happier environment for your wireless. So if I just say my wireless gets 15 meg and three people hop on and have no restrictions and start streaming everything they can and they absorb the majority of that 15 meg, the other two people that just connect have nothing, there's nothing for them. But if I restrict everything to, you know, two to three megs a piece, everybody that joins is getting a similar chunk of that pie and they're going to have a similar, better experience. While the users using Netflix may not get full HD, they're going to get a good overall experience. Now, obviously, the more bandwidth you have, the more you can allocate for different people, and that goes back to the, can my ISP support what I want to do? 
but making sure to control the bandwidth is always a good piece. Allowed ports, or what ports do we want our guest network to use? I can tell you a lot of people don't think about this, and this is something they absolutely should. If you just want a standard guest network uh, that allows customers to browse just websites, really all they need is DNS and access to HTTP and HTTPS. They don't need SMTP, and they don't really need ports above 10,000. Now, making the choice to restrict those ports can actually help your company long term. One, again, it can potentially stop illegal activity, but it'll also help you from becoming blacklisted. If a user steps into your retail space or your, your production or your, your office and connects to the guest Wi-Fi and they have an infected machine that starts spamming out individuals or sending out email, they can get you blacklisted for nothing you actually did. It's just somebody on your guest network. When an organization decides to blacklist you from spam, they don't care if it was somebody on the guest Wi-Fi. They just care about your public IP address. So restricting what guests can do can potentially save you some time and headache in the long run. And finally, content filter. Really take the time to think about what sites you want your guests to hit. Now, especially if you're in a retail space, this is critical because what people see happen in your building, they associate with you. Now, this would be an extreme, but let's say somebody on an iPad is looking at pornography in your retail space. You could offend families or potential customers. They could create a problem, which they you know, go to a manager, they try to find somebody that they need to vent to, they could leave, or they could associate your company with something that, they, that you deem and that they deem to be potentially deviant. So control the content that you have in your guest wireless space to make sure that the image of your company or the values that you maybe want to present to your customers are represented properly. Production wireless. Now, we're not even going to ask open or secure. If this is a production wireless network, it absolutely 100% should be secure. If it is hitting local resources in your office, you must secure it, either WPA2, PSK or WPA2 Enterprise. Um, if you're using some more advanced products like Arrowhive, they have some additional security features, take advantage of those, but it must be secure. When you're trying to determine what applications you could allow, in this scenario, you know, you can still block P2P. I would recommend blocking things like Netflix, Pandora, you know, uh, Apple Music. This is for production. That's not needed there. Put those cell phones and those people who want to stream something, put them on the guest network. Personally, I would restrict it to production applications only. Same with ports and access on where the traffic can go. I would restrict it to only needs for production. Only let your production wireless go to other networks that it must or need to access. And I would only allow ports that production needs. If something infected were to get connected to your production network, you want to control where it can go. And again, as for content filter, I would limit it to what you need for production. Now, we've talked about pitfalls of bad design, why wireless is important. We've talked about how to achieve good design, and we've even examined a, 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 you know, a shot in the dark placement versus a positive design. And finally, we talked about security. But what about different products? Now, there are great wireless products out there. There are phenomenal vendors that are developing new wireless technology or improved wireless technology every single day. Let it be Ruckus, Aruba, Aerohive. You know, Sonic Wall. Everybody's doing great work. There are two access point vendors that we actually have partnerships with and can support if you'd like to work with us. Now, this goes with our wireless designs. We normally limit these to the access points we support because we have a lab with these access points and we know how they work in different environments. The natural one being Sonic Points. For those who know us and know what we do, we are a Sonic Wall company. We have over 4,000 sonic walls around the world, so supporting sonic points and sonic wave devices is just natural progression. And there's some real positives in using these devices. First and foremost, you have easy single pane for management. What that means is if you have a sonic wall and you attach sonic points or sonic wave devices to it, for that building, you can see every access point. The firewall is your controller. It's easy installation because as you're building your your, um, your pieces, as you're building out the networks, as you're building your assets, 
right? For your sonic wall, all those assets can be reused in your wireless environment. They have indoor and outdoor access points. And one piece that's very special to sonic wall devices and sonic points is sonic points and sonic waves encapsulate the traffic in a way that you can tell the sonic wall to only, ex only allow sonic point and sonic wave encapsulated traffic to pass through those ports. Meaning that if somebody plugs in a road access point or plugs in a laptop into an area that should be dedicated to wireless, it won't allow that traffic to reach any other destinations. It will lock it down only to the sonic points and sonic waves. Now our second vendor is a newer vendor for us. We've been partners with them for a little over a year. And it's, it adds some additional flexibility to the wireless space. And that's Arrowhive. Now, Arrowhive is an enterprise wireless solution that is fully cloud managed. You have massive scalability because of that cloud managed piece. So instead of just seeing the access points for one building, you can see all of your access points for your entire enterprise. From that standpoint, you can make changes to a single access point or an access point in every building that you own or manage from, from the same click of a mouse. They also offer indoor and outdoor access points. They have easy access to analytics. Every, everything is done through the cloud. And they have a wide range of models and signal patterns to help you have, uh, to meet the needs of your, of your wireless situation. The final piece, and it's obviously something we've talked about uh, from uh, uh, multiple views, is a wireless survey or predictive models. So for us, wireless surveys, we do on-site active and passive scanning. From there, cost is going to be scaled to the size and the time needed to complete the project. We test the current setup that you have. We test possible AP placements, which is similar to the old AP on a stick, but with much better results and, and different techniques. And we also can perform post scans to confirm placement if we have find any holes in the predictive model. And finally, a predictive model, all right? So these are completed remotely. We use blueprints and measurements um, to complete the model, things that somebody locally will supply to us. As I said before, garbage in, garbage out. It's always worth taking time, you know, measure twice, cut once. So when we're getting measurements from a building, when we're getting measurements from a room, it's always great to make sure you're giving as quality a measurement, quality of information as you can. Cost here, scale to size. Um, and while we never come on site, we have extreme accuracy with these products. Again, uh, for a predictive model, as long as the information we get is, is, is strong. So with that, I want to thank everybody again. Uh, there's my contact information. Again, my name is Sam Sexton. That's my direct line and email. Uh, if anybody has, uh, would like to talk further about some of the products that we offer or wants to really dive into their current wireless situation, I would love to have a conversation with you. Um, uh, I would love to make myself available to have that, that conversation uh, and in-depth analysis of what you currently do or what you'd like to achieve when it comes to your wireless solution. And again, as I can't say it enough times, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to join us. So with that, I don't know if we have any, any questions, um, Kyle or yeah, Joe, that we, we, uh, have a, we have a few. Um, I've seen this question. This question popped up a few times, and, and I think it was probably very obvious to everyone that best practices to, to do a site survey. It's really the only way to, to get it as, as good as it possibly can be. But, you know, obviously, budgets are a factor. A lot of things are a factor with completing things like that. Or maybe we're talking about a very, you know, a very um, small location. So I think mm -hmm. the big question is what, you know, without a site survey, what can people do to improve, what can be done to improve performance, you know, without without that as a factor, either in a small environment or if it's just, if the timing just isn't right and, and wireless problems um, are occurring? Yeah, absolutely. So that's a great question. Um, so there's a few things. I mean, obviously, yeah, first I'll cover the small environment that you asked about here, and then that's, you know, you can, I would always recommend a site survey first and foremost, but there's obviously some small areas um, where you can get by without doing one, and that's, you know, your smaller office, your things like that. If you know you just need two access points, and it's pretty obvious you just need two access points because it's 20 people in a smaller building, that's okay. And, and in most cases, you're going to be just fine. Just make sure to control the power level, and, and, I'll, and I'll cover more of that on things you can do without one, uh, but just make sure to take steps to, to properly set yourself up. 
Um, I always joke around that, you know, I have wireless in my home and I never did a site survey and it works just fine. Um, so there's, you know, there are opportunities where you don't have to have a wireless survey. Now, things you can do either to help your environment currently if you don't have budget or if it's just not in the cards to get a survey done, um, there's a few core things you can make sure to, I could say either do or never do. It depends on how you look at it. But first and foremost, you should never broadcast your access points at full power. That's how they come by default, and you just should not do it. Uh, you should treat half power as full power and start there. Just cutting the signal strength down will normally immensely help you. Now, I will put in a disclaimer on that, and I will warn you that if your environment is having issues currently and you leave this webinar and you go right back to your computer, well, you're at your computer, and you stay at your computer and you go right into whatever controller or wireless solution you have, and you cut the power from full to a half, there will be areas that had signal that was weak that no longer have signal. And that's just a byproduct. But use that opportunity to do the Band-Aid solution we kind of talked about. Again, while it was a, a thing of the past and not always the best way, but you have to use the tools that you are dealt, right? So cut the power, and then if you find a hole, try to patch it with another access point. But Again, a survey is always going to be the best route. Another piece is you should always be running standard band, 20 uh, megahertz. You do not want to go wide band and try to bond channels. You're just creating more noise and hurting yourself unless you truly designed it for greater speeds. It's too often, and I can tell you this happens with sonic points and sonic waves, you install them and you leave everything auto and it's going to put everything to the max. And all that does, if it's not properly designed, is create tons of noise and oversaturation and, and channel absorption and just tears down your network and forms a slow, uh, drudging environment. Turn that stuff off, keep things simple, and it will be able to help you in, in the wireless long run. Awesome. Um, Okay, this question is about the bandwidth management that you spoke about. Um, the question is, is there a best practice on where to manage that bandwidth, whether it's on the AP platform or, or on the firewall? And I think that question is probably more specific to SonicWall because obviously there, there's a direct um, correlation between the SonicWall firewall being the wireless controller versus having a, you know, a dashboard somewhere else to manage it for right. So when it comes from if you're using SonicWall and Sonic Points, you have to do it on, a, on the SonicWall level. Um, you know, there are different products. In fact, we manage one of them, like AeroHive, that actually has application control built into the access point in the platform. Um, from that standpoint, you, do, you could really do it either or. Uh, I, being a, you know, in our company being a SonicWall person, I would recommend doing that from the firewall. Uh, and the reason being, is if something isn't working in your environment, you're then limiting it to, you know, one place where you can check to see if it's a false positive for a security service or an application, or, you know, if something's getting flagged that you don't want getting flagged. When you start doing some things on the access point, some things on your firewall, some things on another piece, you're just segmenting yourself so that when there is a problem, you now have so many different buckets you need to jump into. Now, in our environment, if we were to deploy AeroHive access points and we didn't have a sonic wall at that location and we were asked to do that, we obviously, we would have one place to look and be able to help you and we would do that on the access point level. But personally, I like to keep all of that restriction done from a firewall level to allow all of that to be in one place so when you're troubleshooting and when you're trying to find where you're possibly finding that restriction, you can, you can look at that, that management tool see that it's maybe not application or not, you know, a security service, and then you can go back to the access point and try to confirm that it's not a signal issue. Awesome. Um, one, one more I think we have time for. Um, what is the impact of having APs that run on different wireless standards in the same environment? And I don't know if that refers to the different standards of 802.0, 
you know, 1-1 one, one and, you know, in the letters that come after, or if that's more, you know, having to do with different, with legacy APs. So, Sam, I'll let you take that in whatever direction you, you think is most relevant. We can kind of cover with both. I mean, in the end, um, and this is just, we'll, we'll kind of start with one piece of that, and this is kind of a fun thing you can do with your family and friends as well. Um, in the end, if you have different APs, even potentially different brands, if they're running one SSID and one password, they will, you can have to where you can, you can go from one to the other. Now, the reason why I said family and friends, uh, I personally have anybody who I've set their wireless up with at my friend's house, I give them my SSID and my password, so when I walk into their house, I automatically connect. Um, so you can do that. As for different standards as an 802.11, uh, the best thing to remember is things are going to be weird in your environment in a sense that you could be connecting to a fast, efficient access point, and when you roam to the next one, all of a sudden speeds are going to drop. Now you can roam. It's all going to be based on that SSID. It's all going to be based on that password and the encryption that you're using. As long as it's the same, you can go from one wave two 802.11 AC access point to a you know standard 802.11N. You can go from five gigahertz to 2.4 gigahertz. You can slide back and forth between those, but just know that it's not creating a smooth user experience for a production or guest environment. Normally, what I would say is, you know, and if you're formula formulating a plan, well, you can use different types of access points. I would try to keep them all in the same standard because you have, you know, if you are trying to form a Wave 2 multi-user MIMO environment, you want that to be from the east wall of the building all the way to the west wall. You know, you want that to be universal throughout your environment. That doesn't mean it has to be that way. And you could get by with different standards and different pieces. Um, the big thing to know, though, is if you have one access point that is, uh, cannot support, you know, 5 gigahertz, so it's broadcasting on 2.4, and you have another one that can do 5 gigahertz and 2.4, there's two things you're going to run into. One, depending on the device, they may have to re-enter the password the first time they jump from 4 to 2.4 because they're setting up a new wireless profile. And two, again, you're going to see that speed dip, right? If you're connecting at high speeds on 5 gigahertz and you're having great transfer rates and you roam now to an area with an older version, you're no longer going to get those transmit rates. And that could result in people coming to you as the potential IT professional saying, you know, speeds in the conference room are terrible. Well, they're potentially terrible, they're, or potentially they're not terrible, but they're not as good as everywhere else in your building because that's where the old access point is. Yeah, that makes sense. I think the, the question was probably, you know, mainly for for this purpose, you know, in an environment where there may already be 10 existing APs and new spaces being built out, or maybe only one or two need to be added, you know, how is the new going to play with the old, I think, is is what that question yeah. was referring to. So I think I think that's perfect. But, um, you know, uh, I, I apologize for... Thing. I yeah, said really I would quick. add one thing to that, with that scenario that you just get, and I'll be very quick. If you have that environment where you have older APs and you're purchasing some new ones, Take the time, again, to know where you want your signal, and I would put those new ones in the high traffic areas. Don't just slap them in the new place where you need signal. Put those in the areas where the most users are going to be because that latest technology, that fast speed, that more efficient technology is going to help that area and then move maybe the older technology to lower density areas in your, in your wireless environment. Awesome. Thanks, Sam, and, and I apologize to anybody whose questions we did not get to, but we will make sure to, uh, to follow up afterwards here with you individually. And everyone, thank you again for taking the time to spend with us today, and if you have any additional questions after the, uh, after the call, hopefully you know how to reach us here based on, on Sam's phone number, and you can also just contact sales at certnet.com with any of your wireless planning questions as well. So thanks again, and enjoy the rest of your week. Yes, thank you all.